I'm going into this second stage of this painting after a break and I've got a cotton bud and I dipped it in water and wrung it out and I'm just dipping into parts of the painting where I feel the paint dried a little bit darker than I would like it to have or with harder edges than I would have liked it to have dried and I'm just softening those edges so you can if your paper is very well sized and high quality gently <laughs> rub off some of the paint or absorb some of the paint back up and out don't attempt this with cheap paper the paper needs to be quality watercolor paper with a really good sizing to take this any experimentation will help teach you what paper will do that my favorite paper is my Fabriano Artistico paper the stash that I bought oh, probably 20-25 years ago I bought an enormous supply back then of the highest quality papers enough to certainly last me my lifetime and maybe somebody else's with what I've left over but um, I'm not actually using best quality paper for this I have a lot of um, papers that I cut up into quarter sheets um, to supply my students with which were a lower cost but still a nice quality but not my favorite and uh, they were about 250 gram weight whereas the um, Artistico that I used is about 600 gram weight so uh, I'm actually using those papers that I prepared for my back when I was teaching in class with some um, student live students not online I'm using those papers um, I'm still getting quite a good result because I did make sure they were professional quality papers and I must admit I don't know now what the brands were they would have been a mixture of brands um, Bockingford would have been one of the brands um, wasn't one of my favorites but it's good that I can get a good result even when not using my favorite brands um, given that they still 100% rag content acid free papers and artist quality uh, they're a lighter weight paper than I like to use for my larger sheets but I'm getting a good result so that just shows you don't have to necessarily buy the very best to get a nice result these ones it's important to get a um, a brush that comes to a good point and I'll just grab a couple of brushes here Oops, that there is a cheap squirrel hair I've actually had it pushed out of shape but that's not the point um, now that would sell probably from between um, Australian money we're talking that's quite a, that's quite um, dense there's a lot of hair in there so it will hold a good wa amount of wash and it's a natural fiber but uh, of course there's no point you can't get any detail you could do your large wash with that and um, then you can't go any further you've got to change to another one now this one here oh feel the difference this is petty grease pearl and that is just ordinary squirrel so in other words this is the absolute top of the range I don't know if you can actually get the feeling by looking at the way it moves under my fingers the softness of that this is that that's sort of a harder hair it just oh that just <laughs> gorgeous divine like velvet and the water carrying capacity of that and it points up nicely and they are not even my best brushes that I was working with again I will have had these brushes for a very long time this one here is a Rafael so the other ones were Da Vinci to Rafael another very good brand and uh, again it's Pettigris Pearl beautiful brush and this one here um, I won't mention the brand name it's camel hair about 20 25 dollars Australian money not worth it this um, I'm trying to read this was 22.99 90 on sale <laughs> that price ticket there 
would have been put on probably 20 years ago. Yelp could be looking at $50 today. I don't know. It obviously would have been over $22 today. Um, but you'd get to use this brush. Now, if you get it into a larger size, of course, you can do your big washes and you can do your detail work all because it comes to a point. Whereas that one, you have to keep changing brushes. So you're going to need a, the cheaper your brush, the more you'd have to have a range of brushes. That's actually not as good a quality as the one I'm working with in this picture here, because that one there comes to a much mm -hmm, stronger point and I can do very, very fine lines. I can do the entire painting with that. Uh, it was just convenient to change down in size, but I actually have done quite often the whole painting with a big mop brush because it will just go right down to the finest point. But I've started with the big mop brush, come down to that medium sized mop brush, and then I actually changed to a pure sable, a lovely um, pure sable pointed brush. And I've got pure sables in quite a range of quite a range of prices, uh, sizes I should say. This one is a Da Vinci size 6, quite a nice one, it points out beautifully. I can do good pointed work, but um, invest in one or two, even three, I've used three in this painting, but I didn't need to. Very high quality watercolour brushes if you want to become a watercolourist. Um, and I do advise the natural hair over the synthetic. Um, I've tried some of the um, recent synthetics that some watercolourists recommend their teachers, their students use. Uh, I could tell you a few jokes about that. Um, I paid $500 once, the worst teaching money, I, the, the worst student learning money I ever spent. Uh, but I actually got my money's worth in the end. I won't mention names. I went to a masterclass by a brilliant watercolourist. And I've been to many excellent classes, including masterclasses, by some brilliant artists, and they were worth the money. But this one was the dearest I ever went to, going back some 25 years ago. $500 Australian money back then. And he had his own brand name on his brushes and he was recommending these synthetic watercolour brushes and uh, saying that he did all his paintings with them. But I did notice that when he got up and demonstrated, he picked up, he put the synthetic brush that he was holding up and say, I do my painting all with these. He sort of stuck that down out of sight and picked up a natural hair brush, held that um, brush very close to the feral kind of hiding the thing and he did the whole painting <laughs> with his natural hair, put it down, hit it and then grabbed a synthetic brush and ma tried to make out that it, I don't know what he was taking us artists for, but um, I had to have a really good laugh about that. Now that's going, <laughs> artists are not usually that sort of salespeople, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> And um, when I say that um, it was good value and bad value, one of the students asked him how to do a granulated wash. And uh, I don't know what he said, but he didn't teach her how to do it. Uh, he just um, kind of ignored the question after she'd asked it. And I, I sat there and he hadn't really taught us much at all. And uh, he went around and said, very nice, very nice, dear, patronising to everybody. He never really gave us any instruction. I'm thinking for $500, she's asked him how to do a granulated wash and he's fobbed her off and he's not going to tell her. So, oh, I'm a terrible student. I'm a terrible student in a class. It's a wonder teachers don't throw me out. I stuck up my hand when he was when he acknowledged me i stood up grabbed my bit of paper and i demonstrated and explained how to do a granulated wash kick me out of the class will you uh, well i did get my 500 dollars worth out of that class i came home and realized i was a better teacher than he was and i should be teaching and i started regular art classes <laughs> 
<laughs> so I got my money's worth from that class because um, while I was still learning and will continue to keep learning how to become a better artist, um, yeah, well, I um, also discovered I love teaching. Back to this rose. The main rose, multi-petaled rose, I don't... Uh, lots and lots of little details and they look so strong right now but as I said this shading fades into the paper you always can work a little bit darker with watercolor it'll absorb into the paper and fade also there's quite a lot of shadow in a white or cream rose and I'm looking for the tone I'm not looking for the color of something I'm not thinking I'm not letting my head dictate this this is this is a lot of the problem of painting is your head telling you something and your eyes seeing something else and oh, how do I do this see if I can scribble and explain something what shall we get here um, bit of paper that'll do that's <laughs> and I hold this up, a circle. Whoops, there's a circle. Okay, there's the eyes. Okay, so we see something. And what we see goes in to our inner brain. This is our conscious mind that we think with at the front. And what we see with our eyes goes back into the deeper part of the brain which then tells our conscious mind what it saw. So we don't see and have that go into our conscious mind. We see and it goes back into learned memory. Learned memory then tells conscious mind what it saw. Ah oh dear. So we know that this paper is, can I do it? <laughs> funniest little pin square you ever saw but we know that we are looking at something that's got right angles okay so you look at it and you see right angles now supposing I take this can I do it and hold it up to you oops until that line and that line are almost straight lines See, you come along there and along there and you can hold that so that you are looking at a continual line. So your eyes, oops, your eyes saw a continual line, but your brain knows it's a rectangle. They know it's a right angle there. So when you go and draw that, you draw it out of perspective. And, sorry about that, put my cap back on my pen. So that's why people draw out of proportion. Because the eye saw one thing, they saw that edge of the paper, and that edge of the paper as one continual line. But the mind knew that one went that way and the other went that way. They knew it was a wrong, so they go and draw something that's out of proportion, out of perspective. Because you've got this con conflict between the eyes seeing one thing and the brain telling you, no, that's not what you saw, it had to have been something different. You could not have seen two right angle edges as a straight line. You know that. There you go. You know you know it's that shape but I can hold it up to you and you see a different shape because see it's continual line when you see it lined up like that so you go and draw it differently because learned memory tells you it's that shape eyes saw that shape you go and do a compromise between so 
this is what I'm teaching you to see. It sounds strange to say I'm teaching you to see. Artists learn to see. They do what's called getting their eyes in. You can get your eye in. And that means you can start seeing things as they are. And it's really exciting. It is. It's really exciting when you start looking at things and you can actually see what they are. Because you go through this process of your brain telling you you're seeing something different. You go through this process of your brain telling you that everything that has a right angle has to be painted with a right angle or some strange muck-up variation which is your out of proportion drawings when people say I can't draw. Of course they can draw. It's just that they've got a problem of eye-brain coordination. The eye is seeing something that's going back here into stored knowledge. Stored knowledge is saying you didn't see that because that's physically impossible. You could not possibly have seen a right angle as a straight line. So this is what I think you must have seen and it'll do a variation and send that through to your front brain and say this is what you must have seen because you could not have seen. You've got this brain arguing with your eyes and you've got to learn to stop letting your brain tell you what you saw. You've got to start seeing with your eyes and know and believing your eyes and telling your brain to butt out of it and stop telling you what you saw. Children can see properly. <laughs> I teach two-year-olds, four-year-olds, six-year-olds how to do something, to see something, and then I, and they can grasp it. And I try to teach a grade six-year-old and they don't understand it as much. And then I try to teach it to their parents and their parents and teachers understand it even less. And they have to undergo more of a training to learn to see things as they are. That's what this learning to paint, a lot of it is about, is learning to see. When you can see things as they are, you don't have to trace anymore. But you do have to learn how to do it. It doesn't come naturally if you're an adult and you've gone through this. What do you tell children, you know, grow up, use your brains. I'm telling you to stop, use your brains and use your eyes. And because we've been being told to use our brain for so long, we have to retrain our eye. Well, our eyes are seeing it right. We have to retrain the brain to stay out of it and allow us to see. The brain has got to stop telling us what we're seeing and allow us to know what we're seeing. That's a huge part of learning to paint. And I'll hope that I'll get that through to you as we progress through our training with art. And so what I did there was I threw rock salt onto the painting. And uh, yeah, look how the water is dragging up into that rock salt and you're going to be left with a speckled effect and look how my painting went from being one flower to multiple flowers and here's me trying to adapt for my age <laughs> and do work that's less tiring maybe focus on one flower painting not bouquets of flower painting i have now turned this into a lot and so what I have to teach myself now is to work impressionistically. Yes, work on the largest sheet of paper because it's easier for you to see a larger sheet of paper than try to um, film a small piece of paper. That's fine. But I need to learn to work impressionistically and throw a lot of the painting out of focus and just focus on that one part of the painting in focus, not try to bring quite so much of it up into focus. So this is what I need to learn as I'm teaching you. In the meantime, I'll try to explain as I'm doing these works. You notice I'm keeping my darker tones grayed back. So if they are on the red side, I'm adding a little bit of green to them to mute that red. If they're on the green side, I'm adding a little red to them to mute the green. Same with violet, I would add a dark yellow, which would be a brown to a violet to grade back. 
So I'm using opposites where I need to grey those darker, more muted tones back. And as I said, I'm just loving doing it. Just loving doing this. And I'm hoping that you will get as much fun out of it. It's very important to relax when you're doing watercolour. Very important. Um, don't worry. If it doesn't work, you can go over it with pastel. You can go over it with gouache, which is opaque watercolour. So don't let fear freeze you. Don't, whatever you do, become afraid of doing it. Pattern of light and shade. It's fun. It's expression. And working at the moment with beautiful transparency. But towards the end of this painting, I will show you more opaque techniques to work with it because... I know that, you know, when you're a beginner, you're fearful, will it work? And so by teaching you the opaque techniques to go on at the end, in this case, it will be pastel pencils, you're learning the skill that you don't have to worry about this first stage because you'll be able to do whatever you want to do with it to complete the painting as a beautiful work. This impressionistic stage, the better you can get your pattern of light and shade down at the start, and then develop from there whether you push it through to a great degree of realism because you are younger and you have the eyesight for it and the stamina for it and you happen to enjoy that sort of work that's great but you're building on that good foundation of the light and shade being right or whether you want to sort of stop you know part way between realism and impressionism as I have with this work or as I said if you get that impressionist background down perfectly it doesn't need any more and you can leave it at that stage and you've got a beautiful painting and that's what I've got to work towards <laughs> and um, so we're all working towards something we're all learning something if my work is helpful to you I love it if you would comment leave a thumbs up and subscribe and click that notification bell to help my channel grow thank you